everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I will be talking to you about all of the bookish things I've done in the month of June outside of actual reading. So the first thing that I did was go to a lecture. The Toronto Public Library has this system in place where they have lectures hosted by P newly graduated PhDs where they'll incorporate their studies and their research into discussion with a novel so you can prepare in advance before you go to the lecture and then sit in on it so they kind of assume that everyone present has already read the book the lecture actually took place in a library i've never been to before so i kind of explored the branch a little bit and i picked up this bookmark that was uh, created by a little child in the contest to see who gets the best bookmark and has a fox um great child look kid I love it. Now, the lecture was done by a student who recently graduated from the Faculty of Information, um, but her PhD focuses on rare books or printing history. And the official title of the lecture was A Woman of Business, Women's Literary Labor in Emma Donoghue's The Sealed Letter. So I prepared by reading this book in advance. I went there and she spoke a lot about the implications of women in business. So basically, ever since maybe the like late 18th and all of 19th century, reading, especially reading novels, has been seen primarily as a woman's thing to do. But the business side, to be in actual printing, to work for a printing press, to work with type, to kind of visit your illustrator or any of, of that stuff, is just seen as purely masculine. Like women were allowed to write, they were certainly the ones who read the most, but for the most part, no one was allowed to be involved in the actual publishing. This time in history, the publishing industry is dominated by women in much higher percentages than ever. But uh, when this book is set, which is the Victorian period, that was not the case. So Emma Donoghue's book focuses on a real historical figure, Emily Faithful. And in this book, her name is abbreviated to Fido. I then went to see a play based on the Harry Potter series called The Puffs. And this is kind of looking at the seven years of Hogwarts from the Hufflepuff house point of view, which was hilarious. I know that when it comes to Harry Potter things, everyone else is way ahead of me, so you'll probably know about this play. Um, I found it to be very, very funny. It definitely puts things in perspective for the other students who went to Hogwarts. Um, but I found that it definitely engaged more with the films and with the actors. So like, for example, there were parts where Cedric Diggory um, was making Batman references because the actor recently got cast as Batman. So there were things that were just very much referencing the here and now in a way that um, was very ephemeral. And I enjoyed it and I laughed. It was funny, it was quirky. Um, there were a lot of kids there because I went to a three o'clock in the afternoon uh, performance. I also went through another masterclass, so I got a membership with masterclass. No, this is not sponsored. Last month I went through a lecture with Neil Gaiman and I really loved it. And then this month I did one with R.L. Stein, the author of Goosebumps. And it was just so fascinating because everything that Neil Gaiman said in his lectures, R.L. Stein said the opposite. One of the more memorable things that R.L. Stein says, well, two that I just like, they pop in my head every time I think of the lectures as a whole, were mainly that one, he thinks about the ending first. So he knows exactly how the book is going to end. And he spends the entire book lying to you, which I found hilarious. And the second thing was when he was thinking of the concept of fear for young adults or children, because he writes for like 12 to 14 year old kind of range. Um, he says, you know, we, we try to scare them, but we don't put things that are too real or close to home. Something like parents divorcing is nowhere near um, the line of terrifying horror things. Like you go for things that are scary, but not traumatic scary. Um, he, he explains it better, obviously, but I found that to be very interesting that that's something he has to 
um, actively think about as a writer. He also talks about how young children really like comfort and they go to his books as a sort of roller coaster ride. So they want to be scared and terrified, but they want to safely get out. And he said that there was once a time where he had a book and with not a happy ending or without a resolution of a, a kind. And he got a very uh, negative response from his audience and he got a lot of backlash and letters. So it was fascinating. Uh, like with the Neil Gaiman, I sort of printed out the PDF document that came with it and I kind of follow along uh, as I go through the lectures. I find it very useful to just uh, keep this handy and um, and, and write notes in the margins as I go through. When I accidentally walked into a lecture, I went to Indigo, which is the Canadian Waterstones or Barnes and Noble, and I was just looking at some books and I heard a voice speaking, so I went and sat down, and it turned out to be Graham Simpson, I think that's how you pronounce his name, the Australian writer who wrote The Rosie Project. And I read this book last year when I got super into books about autism. And I remember reading The Rosie Project and really enjoying it. And he's now releasing his third book in the series. It's called the Don Tillman series. And in this one, you have the protagonists of the first books kind of uh, deal with raising a child and having worries about the genetic implications of autism. It was just really nice to hear him talk. It was a small crowd, but it was really nice. And he was just very well-spoken and kind. And I'm really glad I accidentally stumbled into it. I then listened to a lecture on Audible by Michael Drought again. Last month, I listened to his lecture on fantasy writing and Tolkien in general. Um, this month, I listened to his lecture called The Norsemen, Understanding Vikings and Their Culture. This lecture, he sort of goes about setting it up as to, oh, these are all of the uh, mainstream ideas of what Vikings looked like, what they acted like, who they were, and, and then he slowly goes and debunks each of them with this intense focus and passion. I love listening to Michael Drought speak. He has this um, fascinating, like, fast speed tone, and he's just so into what he is talking about. What really surprised me was how every single topic about the Vikings was at one point a heated discussion or argument amongst academics, and there were little things that you don't even think of. Um, another really important aspect of Michael Drought's lecture was how um, he would explain, you know, the Vikings weren't just Vikings versus English. Whenever there was a military, like, raid or whatever, it was often between one Viking tribe versus another Viking tribe. He also emphasizes a lot of the cultural exchanges that happened when things were borrowed and taken. And, of course, he sort of um, drops a lot of the sagas and I was really pleasantly surprised because uh, recently a lot of booktubers have done the saga along. Um, I'll link a few channels down below who participated in this project. And um, it was fascinating to, to sort of learn about it in like a historical context, in lecture format. Um, I definitely enjoyed it. It's from Audible. I'll link it down below if you're interested. And I think there's a sale happening right now with some courses um, on Audible. I think it's two for one until July 4th, not sponsored. I then went to my favorite coffee place in Toronto where I get a lot of teas and sort of kombuchas and stuff like that. And um, I could not walk away from this book. I was looking for it for a long time. Women Who Run With The Wolves, Myths and Stories of the Wild Woman Archetype. I already started reading this. I will not be including it in this month's wrap up because I'm not done. I just started. Um, it's absolutely wonderful already, and it's so up my alley in every possible way. Um, I'm really glad I went, and um, since I'm talking about books I've acquired, I'm just gonna mention a few others, uh, mostly because I didn't get them as like a book haul or like me buying them, as, except for this one. Um, this is what I took, one of the things I took from my grandpa's house. Um, telling Fortunes by Cards, The Doors of the Future, and this is kind of a pamphlet from 1943. And I just thought it was so cool. And um, it has like all these drawings of cards inside. Um, so this is like a fun little thing to have, I think. Lastly, I received three arcs from Tachyon, and I 
have read them and I'm currently working on writing reviews for them. So this is also something that's taken up a lot of time in my month, just writing drafts for reviews. And uh, I don't include the arcs in my wrap-ups or on my channel. I like to think of my reviewing life as separate from my um, books that I'm reading for fun life on booktube, if that makes sense. So the three books I got is The Last Sars um, Dragons by Jane Yolen and Adam Stample. Then I got Meet Me in the Future, and these are short stories by uh, Cameron Hurley. This is sci-fi. Uh, very cool. And the last one is Ivory Apples by Lisa Goldenstein. And I'm really glad I got this one because I read um, The Red Magician with Elizabeth from Books and Pieces for her Lady Vault series. Like, that was one of the first books that um, we read in the group. So that was really, really neat. Um, so it's kind of cool to see that she has a second book coming out. Um, so if you are interested in these, I will be linking reviews as I release them. So those are all the bookish things I've done this month. Please share with me some of the bookish things you've done this month aside from actual reading. I look forward to hearing from you as always. Uh, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Bye!